Thank you, Dr. Krishna Prasad Kodlo. Moving on to the outermost structure, the eyelid uh, and eyelid tear repair is generally required after some blunt trauma or uh, uh, trauma with a sharp instrument. The first thing that you should rule out is rule out a globe injury. If there is a globe injury, that requires to be treated first and then only you come on to the uh, eyelid. Always photograph these cases because medically legally, if the patient is not happy cosmetically later, you can always show the extent to which it was injured earlier and therefore you have something to stand by. Uh, there is no debridement necessary, only if it is grossly necrotic do you have to debride the wound. Otherwise, just a betadine cleaning with removal of foreign uh, dust particles which are frequently there is all that is required. So, you can either have a partial thickness tear or a full thickness tear involving the lid margin. Partial thickness tears are pretty easy to suture, they involve the anterior lamella. Just uh, you suture them in layers uh, by using uh, interrupted uh, sutures. The first layer, like any other uh, skin wound, would be buried subcutaneous, buried subcutaneous uh, sutures, followed by more interrupted sutures at the superficial level. Full thickness lacerations if uh, uh, most frequently involve the eyelid margin, if not always. And eyelid margin uh, involvement is very, very crucial because later on if you do not uh, follow uh, certain principles, there can be uh, a notching of the lid which is disturbing cosmetically. So basically you have to align the eyelid both in the vertical as well as the front and back uh, directions. In both axes you have to uh, orient it. You start by looking at the landmarks that is the eyelash line, the grey line and the uh, orifices of the mebomian uh, glands at the lid margin. So once you do that, you align uh, these and then you pass a vertical mattress suture through the central portion that is the grey line. In front of it is the ciliary line and behind it is the mebomian gland orifices. You pass just this one suture so that you get good alignment. If you are not happy with the alignment, redo it. This is very crucial. Alignment of this particular suture is very crucial. And when uh, once you are done with it, there should be slight eversion of the lid margin. There should not be any horizontal displacement. Any horizontal displacement at this stage would mean a notch in the lid margin later on. So once you put these sutures, you are happy with the alignment, you just loosen them and then uh, repair the tarsal plate. Do not penetrate into the conjunctiva, just interrupted sutures into the uh, tarsal plate, followed by again retying the marginal sutures. The posterior most uh, uh, line can be just one interrupted uh, suture. So. After that, you go back to the anterior lamella with the same thing I mentioned earlier, a buried subcutaneous suture as well as a superficial suture. To sum it up, first you put the marginal suture to align it, then you suture the tarsal plate, then you come back to the lid margin, uh, make sure there is proper alignment and then suture the anterior lamella. This is how uh, lid uh, tear repair looks intra-op and immediate post-operative. Make sure that these sutures at the lid margin are left pretty long so that they do not abrade the sclera and cornea giving rise to discomfort post-operatively. As mentioned earlier, lid margin notching is uh, uh, to be avoided at all costs. Uh, some special situations. Uh, if the lateral canthus is disinserted, you might have to reconstruct it. Just take a bite into the periosteum so that the lateral canthus uh, is uh, well inserted. Then you have some other special situations. Now, this patient walked into OPD with a hood on his head to cover this. A huge piece of wood has gone right into this. Why is this in my talk uh, when there is obvious globe injury? Uh, at this stage, you don't know the amount of damage. Uh, we w w wanted to do an MRI but the radiologists refused an MRI because they were not sure if there are uh, more foreign particles at the end of this wooden piece and therefore it had to be an intraoperative uh, ex exploration. This is how the patient was immediate post-op with the lid tear repair and this is him much later. His globe was totally intact, lucky for him. So all he had was just a lid uh, uh, tear repair that was needed. If there is any tissue loss, you can either directly advance it by doing a lateral canthotomy or in case of 
bigger uh, tissue loss, you can take flaps like you suture uh, uh, lids after a cutler beard procedure or other uh, uh, cancerous uh, uh, involvement. Another special uh, situation is when there is canalicular injury. If there is canalicular injury, you need to put a stent. Otherwise, there won't be alignment or uh, it will heal with scarring and therefore the patient will have watering uh, permanently later on. The stent is put for both the upper and the lower canaliculus. Uh, it is said that the lower canaliculus drains most of uh, the lacrimal uh, fluid there, but upper canaliculus also has to be sutured. The uh, earlier school of thought was only if the only the lower canaliculus needs to be repaired, but then in some patients, if you do that, there will be persistent watering and your whole uh, repair. Uh, takes a hit, there's no point of repairing only the lower canal plus. So if the upper canal plus is involved, uh, both the upper and the lower have to be stented. Most frequently, however, it's only the lower lid which tears along with the canal plus. And in such cases, uh, you, all you need is a monocanalicular stent. With this stent, you avoid any damage to the undamaged upper uh, canal plus. And also there's no uh, need of any nasal intervention. For identification of the lateral end, all you can do is pass a stent. Identification of the medial end of the cut canaliculus is a little more tougher. If the upper canaliculus is not involved, you can just irrigate some fluorescein through the upper canaliculus. It will come out through the medial end of the cut canaliculus and thereby you can identify it and pass the stent. So this is what is called as the mini monoca stent, self-retaining. It's got this small uh, extended area there, which comes and sits above the punctum, does not need any sutures to the canaliculus itself. So this is how it is inserted. This is the upper, uh, the end, which would prevent further migration of the stent. This is with it in place. Another uh, clinical picture here, the mini, uh, uh, punctum is here, the canaliculus is damaged. That is first passed and followed by the lid suturing. Actual suturing of the canaliculus is not uh, really required when you pass such stents. That's because this stent would maintain alignment as well as prevent scarring within the lumen itself. This diagram is showing how to suture uh, the canaliculus, but this used to be done in the past. Nowadays, we don't bother with that. We just put the stent and it will heal by its own.